Hello, I'm Bill T. Jones, Artistic Director of New York Live Arts. Welcome to Live Ideas 2021, Altered Worlds, Black Utopia, and the Age of Acceleration, and to Interspace. We opened yesterday with four installations taking over our building at New York Live Arts, which is located in Lenape Hoking, the ancestral home of the Lenape people. This year's Live Ideas has been two years in the making, postponed because of the pandemic. The events of this past year have made the theme of the festival even more urgent and relevant. The festival also marks a turning point for New York Live Arts. For the first time since March of last year, we will have a live audience in our theater and studio. Drexia Redux, an Afro-futurist cabaret, opens tonight in the studio. And Saul Williams's The Motherboard Suite will open tomorrow night in the theater. It's a step towards normal. We're very fortunate to have as our co-curator the brilliant Dr. Rinaldo Anderson and to be partnering with the Black Speculative Arts Movement, a network of artists, writers, thinkers, activists, many of whom are part of this festival. And now, Please welcome Rinaldo Anderson, who will introduce today's events. Thank you, Bill, for that kind introduction. Uh, today, I'm proud to be introducing two remarkable, bright people who are extremely knowledgeable about Octavia Butler. Ayanna Jameson is a deaf psychologist and is the founder of the Octavia Butler Legacy Network, a global community founded in 2011, committed to highlighting Octavia Butler's life and work while creating new works inspired by Butler's legacy. The Legacy Network grew out of Ayanna's research for her doctoral research on Butler's life. Her dissertation is entitled, Certainty of the Flesh, a biomythographical reading of Octavia E. Butler's fiction. She is an organizer, educator, and teaches ethnic studies courses at California State University Polytechnic Pomona. Adrian Marie Brown is the writer in residence at the Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute and author of We Will Not Cancel Us and Other Dreams of Transformative Justice, Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds, and the co-editor of Octavia's Brood, Science Fiction from Social Justice Movements, and How to Get Stupid White Men Out of Office. She is the co-host of How to Survive the End of the World, Octavia's Parables, an Emergent Strategy podcast. Adrian is rooted in Detroit. And now I'd like to welcome uh, Adrian Marie Brown and Ayanna Jameson. Hello. Hi, my love. It's so good to see you. You too. Thanks, Dr. Anderson, for having us. It's lovely to see you. The last time I saw Dr. Anderson in person, we were all together at Princeton. So this is a reunion of sorts, right? I know. That um, was a long time ago. It was, but it feels like yesterday, given the themes that we talked about there. And I really feel like this, this idea of Octavia E. Butler's prescience comes up over and over again. And I just want to hear really your take and about some of the work that you've done with um, the Ideation Institute, with Walida, um, that really speaks to those themes um, and the upcoming work that you have that talks about that. Because I think that will help us to get into our Groove. Into our groove. Um, okay, well, first I'm just still fangirling that Bill T. Jones is <laughs> just in the house. Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> I'm just like, hey, dreams, dreams keep coming true. Um, and I'm really, I have to say, I'm so grateful to get to be here with you in this conversation. I just feel like people, like I feel like everyone needs to be paying so much attention to Octavia E. Butler right now. And I think the Legacy Network is one of the places that people can turn to for that attentiveness. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, for me, Octavia Butler has been 
a, a North Star of a way of looking, a way of seeing, a way of attending to the world. Um, and that started, you know, from the instant I first came in contact with her work. And, um, but then what, when Walid and I, when our paths kind of crossed with each other, by that point, it was like, I was really looking at like Octavia Butler's onto something. Like she's been, she was paying attention to something and what she wove into the fiction that she wrote was analysis, was strategy, was uh, sort of a complex concept of how the world interacts with itself and, and how we need to play and interact with the world. So it's like, she's onto something. And of course, when you, when something's that clear, you're never alone in thinking it. Right, it's like she's onto something, and actually, there's already a huge network of people who think that, but we're not necessarily connected or tied in with each other yet. Um, and so, Walida was at that point birthing the idea of visionary fiction, and had just put out the Left Turn magazine, the issue on visionary fiction, and I had written for it, and we'd never met in person before. Um, but we made this decision, you know, like we were emailing each other and I was like, look, I see what you're up to. You see what I'm up to. We should do an anthology that just puts us in the practice of what Octavia Butler was doing, which was looking at the future and saying, "We, what is it that we've never experienced that we have to imagine into existence and we have to practice it with our imaginations in these stories, on these, on these pages. Um, and that became Octavia's brood. And it was really asking a bunch of people who are trying to change the world. You know, our, our hypothesis is all organizing is science fiction, right? Is that what we are up to when we're trying to imagine a new world and organize for it is science fictional behavior, um, is looking at what is and actually extrapolating into the future. Um, and then, you know, emergent strategy was already in the chamber at that point. Like it was really like on, on the way. And I knew, um, having, you know, been reading Octavia and been like, oh, she's paying attention to like slugs and she's paying attention to like bees and ants and birds and all of that is showing up and dolphins. And like, how can I pay attention to the nature of my world? And how can I invite more and more people to pay attention to the nature of our world? Um, and the text that particularly stands out, like I, I, I'm, you know, obsessed with the parables and I'm sure we'll spend some time there tonight. Mm -hmm. But I'm also thinking about how in the um, Xenogenesis series, how there's this mating that happens with aliens and there's all this stuff that's happening into the future. But one of the most beautiful parts of it is they end up being able to build structures in relationship with the earth that em emerge organically from the ground to become their homes, these living structures. I think about that all the time because Octavia was so right about everything she's predicted so far uh, for the period that we're living in and living into. And I'm like, but could she also be right about that? Like how far out was her imagination um, accurate? Okay. So, so those are some thoughts in like emergent strategy, you know, um, we can talk about it some, but it's really like, how do we get in right relationship with change? That feels like the main directive that, that Octavia was giving us in so much of her work is that changes constant. And if you recognize that, you can actually predict that the one thing that we can count on is that things will change. And so how do we get really good at changing rather than how do we get good at building things that are unchanging or unchangeable or creating selves, creating identities for ourselves that are unchangeable. So that's some of the ways that it's shown up for me. I would love to hear from you because, you know, I know that you have the Legacy Network and I also know you're working on the biography of Octavia. Um, I'd love to hear how, how her prescience has shaped your own life. And also if you were to articulate what you saw as the practices she was engaged in, right? Like what was she, how was she doing it? Well, one of the things that always um, like pops up for me is the way that she was really a pedestrian. Um, and I think it's fitting that we're in New York virtually because she traveled there many times. Her agent was there. There were things that she went to, but here she took public transportation or she got rides from people who had, who offered, but, but she would go on walks every day. Tell so people where talk, the tour is. Tell people so where you I, are right now. Yes, yes. And Adrian has been here in my home. So like mm -hmm. she, she, 
she's auntie for me. This is a very organic um, relationship. But I live right in the foothills, so I'm looking at the mountains where the parables took place, and basically a, a place analogous to Robledo or yes. um, the place where Mary lived in mind of my mind, mm -hmm. uh, foresight. So it's this place nestled in the foothills with, with highways and freeways nearby, but also a, a location that used to be groves of um, oranges and citrus and a lot of agriculture and not so much wine here, but a little bit farther east, we had vineyards and different things. So really a transforming landscape that was really, really ethnically diverse and mixed, but also divided by class. There's a street um, that's about a half a block up from my house, Foothill Boulevard, which used to be part of Route 66, the famous Route 66. And that was a line which those of us who were people of color could not cross, could not mm -hmm. live unless we had the necessary papers. So this is the place in California um, where she lived um, and not in my city, um, but in a place very much like this um, in Pasadena. So I grew up in Pasadena. My parents were divorced. So I spent a lot of time driving back and forth on this freeway, mm -hmm. you know, going back and forth for visits and spending part of the time in each parent's house. Um, and so she grew up with a single parent um, like I did, but she did not have siblings. So for me, I see my work unfolding differently as I engage in different things. Like, for example, when I was a substitute teacher, I would see this emergent strategy and this um, all these rituals emerge and have this really hyper aware connection with my students, mm -hmm. um, wondering what it is that they were doing, like how were they processing a lot of the things and the traumas that were happening. And I was really reading her work as trauma literature uh -huh. um, and the earth as a body that she realized we were inhabiting, almost like the Gaia hypothesis. Uh -huh. So really her work and this location and my awareness of it is like a spiral. I've said this before and it sounds nutty, but like if you've been to Paris or if you've ever seen a map, it's this spiral, the Arondis Mont, the neighborhoods go oh, yes. around the spiral. And they and extend like, out, you know, Detroit is half, is the half Paris, right? Along the river. So right. Half, half, um, spiral. Yes. So it's like the conch, the conch shell mm -hmm. is like Detroit. And then there's this whole underworld of all of these, not underworld, I don't mean underworld as an above below, but like a, yeah. a non-physical place that's also connected and happening. And that's how I experience her work because I can be driving or walking or going a place and I'll be like, oh, that's totally in the book. Yeah. Or this intersection that she's describing or this bus route or this grocery store. So it's very mm -hmm. local, but also this global manifestation of the, fact that a, apocalypse is already happening for someone that's that right. slavery is ongoing for someone yeah um that um there's there's more than one world that's happening yeah. um at one time and that's really the sense i get the entire afrofuturist or black speculative arts turn happens in her first set of published novels in that's right. the um patternist series and what i keep thinking as i read more and more books is that when she's writing Pattern Master, there's all these epic feminist fantasies that are coming out. Like, uh -huh. that, like there's all of these fantasies where people are like traveling places on, on horseback or on animal back, and there's all these things happening. But like Pattern Master has the structure that people are using now, even if like she did, you know, Octavia rode so that we could gallop. This is how I feel uh, um, when yes. I'm reading new things. Um, and all, all across all different genres. Um, and I, you know, I'm metabolizing it all the time, but I have to say, I feel so much better today than I did, let's say a year ago when I was doing things like this, because people were saying like, you know, Octavia predicted this, this was a future. As a matter of fact, the last thing that occurred before everything shut down was the parable of the Sower opera at UCLA uh -huh. um, with mm -hmm. Toji and everyone, mm -hmm. right? So all of this was already in the works. As you say, the way emergent strategy is like, we were like, okay, this is sold out. There's 800, 1800 people in this space. Um, yes. We're gonna take this, be in community and talk about mutual aid and all these other things that people were not doing that we've been talking about. Yes. Um, you know, community gardens and um, leaving and manifesting work that is generative for the community that it's in, as opposed yeah. to building some kind of silo, strategic partnerships that redistribute 
wealth to yeah. people who don't have it. So there's so much that's come out of her writing that people are living by, not not as like, you know, I really wish I I wish that she were here so that we could fandom and fan cast and all of those things that we do yes. for other contemporary novels. I feel like there's something in the pattern in the pattern. Um, yeah. Like I don't know if you want to tell people what the pattern is, but I feel like that's kind of where we're at as we we're not post COVID, but no. the pattern is a thing that we can <laughs> rely on and that we've been enacting in this space as we connect with each other virtually. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, the pattern, um, the, I love the pattern of series in general as something that people should understand because it was the first thing that she wrote, the first thing that she was publishing. And it was like the first big idea she had. Like she had this concept of this pattern that connected people. And the way it works is it's really a telepathic pattern that people are, um, you know, they're pulled into. They're pulled into. And what we, if you were to read it backwards, the way she wrote it. So she wrote the final novel in the series. She wrote that one first. And then the, she basically went backwards to try to excavate, like how would we get from where we are now to right. a, a people that could do this, that could communicate in this way. But once you're in that pattern, once you're connected in that pattern, you can communicate, you can negotiate, you can share power, you can share um, connectivity, you can share skills with each other. And um, we laugh, I think we've laughed many times about calling ourselves first family because right. the pattern begins with these children of two different kinds of immortals. One is an immortal who body snatches, who jumps from body to body to body. And another is an immortal who heals, who's able to look within herself or look within another and look within nature and learn how to stitch back together what is wounded, um, how to, um, uh, open a way where there seems to be no way or blockage inside the body. And even that text to me, that feels like some of her most prescient work because the battle that's happening between those immortals is everything you need to know about the path of a capitalist extractive economy battling for the body of the earth. And on the other side is this um, economy and way of being that is how do we be in right relationship what is healing what is resilience how do we recover when harm happens um, and how do we how do we orient ourselves in an abundant world view right so these two things these two energies you know octavia is so brilliant because she says we can't actually you can't necessarily choose between them there's a battle there's a tension between them that is fundamental to humanity right we're, we're really in a fundamental push and pull and there's things about both ways of being that are intrinsic to us and we have to navigate how we're going to do this and the pattern then her children the children that come from that union eventually have this awakening of there's something that that you know alexis pauline gums who's one of our contemporary writer friend yes. beloved alexis talks about the fact that we're not individuals and nature shows us this over and over again if you tune in you can feel what's happening with others around you. You can, you absolutely are interdependent on others around you. There's no separateness. Um, so in the pattern, that becomes a visible, tangible, undeniable thing. It's like as clear for them as if they had picked up a telephone and were calling someone on the phone. Or, you know, now what we do is we Zoom each other. We're on video cameras here on StreamYard or whatever. And we're in the pattern calling out to each other. Here's what we need. Here's what we're sharing. I think the pattern is a way of thinking about mutual aid at a spiritual cosmic um, capacity level. So that text, you know, I'm like, oh, that's happening now. But that battle is also still happening is are we committing ourselves to this extractive, exploitative economic situation that doesn't heal? that doesn't actually recover. The reason we're not past COVID right now in many ways is because we are living inside of an extractive economy that refused to slow down, to stop, to redistribute resources so that we could pause and, and stop this thing from spreading, right? And the healers were all up in the mix being like, okay, where do we bring our hands? Where do we bring our attention? And what Octavia's stories tell us is we bring our attention to those that we can love 
th those that we can care about, those that we can fortify in a value system, because that fortification will pass the, down the lineage into the pattern that is to come, right? So yeah, I <laughs> I'm just like I definitely think we're in the pattern, and I definitely think I this definitely think so too. Octavia scholarship is a is also a pattern. Like I keep telling people, there's so much exciting scholarship of Octavia's work and life happening right now. I'm like, this is a rich time. Um, I don't know if, if I just got to do an event uh, maybe a month ago with Linnell George, who did the Handful of Earth, Handful of Sky book which is about Octavia's writing process and everything. And it's just like outstanding. So, you know, there's so many people now pulling the patterns, the continuous patterns, the continuous prophecies out of her text in Huntington Library and other places. Um, yeah, those are some, some of the ways I'm seeing that pattern emerge. What about you? Well, when I think about it, and um, we're not gonna necessarily give away our age, although, you know, it doesn't matter, <laughs> but those books- like everybody know mine. But those books were published. So Kindred, her most popular book, Pattern Master, um, those were published around the time when we were born. So when yep. we were gestating, those books were gestating. And she yep. wrote the original concepts for those books when she was in her teens. So yes. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. That's when she was coming up with these concepts and observing the way the world was. Yes. So I think for me, and I, this kind of goes back to your original question, and this is something that's maybe like foretold for us personally, mm -hmm. is that the times when she was giving birth to her books and fighting for her books to exist and being yes. rejected is the same time that we were coming into the world and coming into consciousness, yeah. um, literally. Um, Pattern Master, I believe, was published in 1976 or 1977. Yeah. Uh, I believe Kindred was published in 1979. So yeah. she's Promise coming one. up. Yes. So she's coming <laughs> up with these ideas about the difference between um, a science that uses up and discards every resource as like a shell and then jumps to the next resource resource. Yes. And the difference between, you know, she wouldn't even write Lilith's brood for another 20 years. However, we have seeds of the scientists uh, of the yeah. generative properties of um, Lilith who in our real life is um, Gila Cells, which is Henrietta Lacks, right? So, yes. you know, this is a movie that Oprah was in and or produced, right? This is like something that's <laughs> right the level. And yet this is like a little note card that Octavia has and she's waiting yes. to use it. So really the characters are scientists. It's like the mad scientist that's trying to create something in his own image yes. and the scientist who wants to use, who wants to give everybody vaccines. Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, I think that what, what you're also, like, as you're speaking, the thing that I'm thinking is perhaps the most prescient thing about Octavia's work is that she understood that the story of the Black woman surviving is the central story of humanity in this period. And it's very much aligned with the Kumbahi River Collective statement. It's like, if black women were free, it would necessitate that everyone, you know, everyone else would literally have to be free in that scenario because of how our society is structured. And I feel like Octavia was writing the fiction that plays with that, plays that into existence. It's like, if black women were leading, what becomes possible? If we were listened to when we have our destiny moments and our prophecy moments and prophetic moments, what would be possible? If we were the ones who were sent to be in relationship with alien species and to figure out how to negotiate human value and worth in that scenario, what would come forth, right? It's so radical for the time that she's writing at a time when still the primary character, the lead, the protagonist that we normally see is a white man saving the world, interacting with aliens, the one who has the destiny, the one who figures it all out. And she's like, actually, what would it look like if it was black women? Actually, it's gonna have to be black women. And I think if we look at this period of our social movements and our history, we have Tarana Burke, we have Alicia Garza, we have Patrice Cullors, we have so many incredible dynamic black women protagonists who are shaping and reshaping and changing everything about the culture and what we think is possible. And I don't think that's accidental. And I also, and I don't know, you know, you have kids now in this age range. I have nibblings in this age range. I feel very aware that a lot of her protagonists were quite young and are coming into the age range that they would be like, they would be the protagonist of the parable of the sower, right? right. Sower starts in 2024 
and the lead character is 15 going on 16 in that in that moment and i'm just like okay so that means that those people right now are at the, the you know in the sort of 11 to 13 range and i'm like i've got babies in my life that are in that age range and one of the things her work has be has me listening to them differently right as i'm like okay like how do I stop interacting with you like a baby, you know, and how do I start interacting with you like a visionary who um, the more I listen to you, the more I can cultivate your own awareness of the world and of justice and of liberation and of, um, of the interconnectedness and interdependence of all of us. Because, you know, this pandemic shows us that the, the walls that we hold between what it means to be an adult and what it means to be a child are so porous, you know, right. the kids all know what everything is now. They know what's right. going on. They know how to, they're the ones who are running <laughs> so much of the show right now. Right. No, absolutely. And I keep, I always say this, like I remind people, Lauren Alamina was born in 2009. Exactly. So, so her age, you know, she was born in 2009. Um, and it's, it's very specific. Um, I think about the way that Stacey Abrams, yeah. has been attacked recently for being a romance author. And for me- I love her I novels. Like I read all of them. I haven't, I haven't <laughs> I read, read them. I read all of them. I picked it oh up my like, gosh. it was like, I'm just gonna read one and just see how it feels because I'm not really a romance reader. I have consumed them all. It is such a guilty pleasure that I don't feel guilty about. It's, they're well, so great. <laughs> yes, and I feel like, I think if Octavia were writing now, I do think that she would be, like when you read the love scenes in any of her books, but especially in um, Fledgling, yes. with another young, uh, uh, an, uh, a black female protagonist who appears to be young and ageless, although she's older, right? Yeah. But she's taking control of her sexuality and her pleasure and what it means to be partnered with someone who is consenting yes. and who is open um, yeah. So I do think are that- Are multiple people who are consenting and open. Right, <laughs> so she's writing these books that people are writing now, but she, like we, what would we com consider some of her work epic fantasy or urban fiction or yeah. contemporary romance? Because I'm not oh, a romance reader like either, but yeah. I have been reading, you know, epic fantasies, ch long form children's books. Um, yeah. Uh, like sword and stone, t dragons. Um, That's right. Yeah, all kinds of things. Well, and so and if people don't know, Fledgling was the last book that Octavia finished and published and it's a vampire, it's a young vampire uh, novel, right? It's a young black vampire who's a melanated vampire. So it's like, because they're black vampires, they can still go out at, during the day and, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, continue. There's also pattern yes. and symbiosis in that. So. Yes, but uh, so she is a genetically engineered, meaning her birth and her personhood are intentional, and she is she is combined with the DNA of the vampire species so that yes. she can help the species to evolve and change and live in the present whenever okay. that is. Um, and so I've been reading these um, epic romance vampire novels and this so-called so mm -hmm. paranormal romance, but this is really the genre that Octavia's writing in, like sex with aliens, oh, you yeah. know, telepathy and all this other stuff. And because I'm not a romance reader, I was missing this quality in her work that is present that oh, she yes. is definitely casting the black woman and multi blended families, chosen families as the quintessential or archetypal ways that families will be like the single unit of mom, dad, baby, baby, and the dog. That's one type of manifestation, yeah. but that doesn't, that's nowhere in any of her work. No, um, it's not. In those relationships that are the things that you find on commercials in the, you know, we, we are just seeing mixed race couples being together on a you know, target billboard or whatever. And you or, know, it was or, controversial or for her when she was writing it. She talked about how much pushback she got for Kindred for having a multiracial couple there. But then, I mean, she continued, she pressed on because I think that's the other piece is that she's like, just because you don't like it doesn't mean it's not happening. And it doesn't mean there's not a way for it to happen with integrity. And I think that she was thinking about that all the time. It's like, Black women can figure this out. Like, we, we can figure out how to move with integrity. We can figure out how to be in these righteous relationships. Even having the vampires 
in some ways feels like a response to the tension between the extractive and the healer is she figures out a way to have vampires who don't kill those who they draw blood from, but it's a symbiotic pleasure relationship, right? That it's like, yes, like you sustain me in this way and I sustain you through all these immense pleasures and research. I make you stronger, I make your your life, you know, your life better basically in every way. And I'm like, of course, Octavia would figure out like, yeah, the, the answer is that there has to be relationship. And throughout every single one of her texts, the solution, the answer is always community. The answer is always deepening the relationship. And her characters are in the most danger when they have gone off in some isolated way on their own and trying to navigate or figure it out on their own. That's where the most danger. And when they're able to actually deeply connect authentically in relationship with other people um, of all backgrounds, because she really does right. say that, you know, she's just like, you know, I say, I, I, I say this all the time about her that it's like, you, she teaches us, you never know who you're going to end up in the apocalypse with. So you better learn how to, as she says, embrace diversity. You better learn how to be in relationship with who shows up, which means in a lot of ways, challenging the construct nature of our whole society, which is we're given these very small labeled identities in which to exist um, immediately. As soon as we're born, we're like, oh, you fit into this or this gender box and this or this sexuality and this or this race and these other things, which none of them are actual uh, biological conditions that should shape our lives, right? And in her text over and over again, she leads us, she lets us follow someone out of that. You know, it's like, oh, you were told that this is what a woman does. Actually, a woman does this. You're told that this is what a human does. You don't even have to stay a woman. You can shape shift. You were told that this is what kind of sex you're going to have. Maybe you guys can switch genders in the midst of the sexual act and have a whole different other experience. You were told that this is who's going to lead us into a relationship beyond this planet. Actually, it's going to be this little black girl. You know, I just, I love that she continuously is like, the construct is a construct. And if we can break it, then we can go beyond it and our our species can survive. And inside that, we don't have to relinquish blackness. Like her characters who are black, they never relinquish their blackness. They never relinquish black culture while still moving beyond these constructs. And it's always the default. It's not that they're transcending race yes. and leaving and leaving it behind or that being raceless or somehow generic or subsumed by mm -hmm or making it or leaning in, it's never that. But she's yeah. already witnessed through her grandmother and her aunties and her mother, those black women who survived in spite of the things that were done to them and the restrictions that were put on them. Right. And I feel like that's the most prescient thing as well, because there's something in that for everyone, if they can figure out what space they're taking up and how they can share space with someone who also has a resource. And that's this right. is what we do find out in the pandemic, right? You know, right. I've had people, you know, who is it that is in the apocalypse with like, whose door do you knock on? What, <laughs> where, where's the person who is in your reach? And then all that you touch, you change, all that you change changes Changes. you. It becomes a totally different thing when yes. we're going through all this like hygiene. I was thinking the other day about the first flight that you took. I don't even know, <laughs> March or April, 2020. It was and March. You were like, well, they're mm -hmm. saying not to wear a mask, but I'm going to wear a mask. And then you had, like a scarf and you're like, what you're not gonna do is spit directly into my mouth. That's and right. what I, you know, for <laughs> me though, that was a real, because I hold my breath when I'm passing people, even in a mask. So literally uh -huh. my body started to change and really take on all the stress and trauma and wow. triggering. Wow. But I remember you like embodying this thing that, you know, you were flying because you had already planned to fly and you knew you had some places to go. And you're, I mean, I mean, I follow this and I'm like, oh, okay, now I understand why my spirit is this way because I see what Adrian is doing in the world because I yeah. like you're living a part, like a part of the auntie yes. life that I lived. And so I'm deeply connected to that. And I'm like, okay, if Adrian doesn't feel safe, yeah. Or if Adrian is questioning what's happening in this conglomerate, consumptive, like then I need to take a pause. And that's the that's yeah. one of the ways I live in relationship. <laughs> paying attention right to who's paying attention. I deeply believe that. I mean, Octavia helped me get through that moment. You know, I was in Italy and I was like, you can't stay here. You have to really pay attention to the signs right now. You need to get some place where you can, for me, it was like, you need to get some place where you can be near the ocean because I was supposed to be on sabbatical. And it was like, I could stay here and risk everything, but this thing is moving so fast. And I felt like, I'm like, okay, 
Octavia said, be ready to go. You need to be ready to go. Like the, this time is now. And I had one of those days in your life where I, I, I had to make a decision. And within an hour, I needed to leave the place that I was and be ready to travel internationally. And, and it was a thing where I was like, getting these signs, you know, people were telling me, oh yeah, you don't have to wear a mask. It, it's fine. We're not going to do any testing like that. Da, da, da. And I mean, watching, you know, hundreds of people pouring into the country. And this was the very end of that, right? Right after this, the borders closed, but watching all these people pour in and they're like, it's fine. And just knowing, knowing it wasn't fine. Like, I'm like, I know it's not fine, but one of the things Octavia writes over and over again is you can't count on a government that doesn't love you to tell you the truth about what's happening, right? Like all of the conditions we're in are based on that fatal flaw of hierarchy and intelligence that those who end up in power often use their intelligence to keep others down or to keep others unsafe. I'm like, oh, y'all think it's fine if hundreds of thousands of people die from this thing, as long as it's not your people, as long as it's not right. the, your, the folks you consider dear. And you know, that knowing that, knowing that I'm like, that's the country we live in currently, that's where we're coming from. I'm not gonna necessarily take that guidance. I've got to pay attention to my gut, pay attention to my instincts. And I have to say, I had to kind of overcome some of that to take the vaccine, right? Because I was like, okay, how do I think collectively, always think collectively and not just individually, even if I'm in a circumstance where I'm like, I don't necessarily trust these systems, but thinking collectively means that this is the move to take. And I was like, I wonder what Octavia would do. <laughs> I wonder what she would think of this choice, you know? Um, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, I know we have a few more minutes before we move into Q&A. And, <clears throat> you know, Octavia didn't have children and she wrote about, you know, young people and she wrote some things around child rearing. But as a mom who is also a science fictional thinker and beer, what do you feel like Octavia offered to parents? Like what is the, what do you think is the prescient prophetic wisdom that she was writing into her text for those who are raising the next generations up? Well, going back to something you were saying about the age of the characters and yeah. a lot of her stories being coming of age stories, I feel like one thing that I have learned is that my children do not belong to me. I do not possess them. I was only gifted them and it's my job to make sure that they survive into the future so that they can do the things that they are supposed to do. And mm -hmm. it's really helped me to parent by following what their attention is and has really opened my entire consciousness to texts and books and things that I wouldn't read, but also yeah. giving them things that I didn't have, like having them read Nettie Okorafor's books, even the ones that are not really for children, right? <laughs> You're like, um, read this. Well, he's read the Akata books um, yeah. and the little one will listen as well. And I can say like, okay, there's some bad words in this, but the concepts and understanding, mm -hmm. you know, the presentism of like spirituality and all kinds of things, I have to explain and be honest with myself about the ways that I am a person who needs to work on things myself so that I am not passing that on to them. And it's mm. a, it's hard work, right? Because you learn these structures, you learn within these structures and you think like they're gonna be in these structures, but you and other aunties and other black women are paving the way mm. for there being another way of being. And I, she helps me to trust that. Yeah. Um, I've been working through my own traumas and I know Autumn and I have talked about this before, working on my own things so that I'm not being the colonizer to them or I'm That's right. keeping them safe in a way that doesn't damage who they can be when I'm not here. Um, right. Because I know that they're better at school in other places, but they also are, you know, again, so much like you and so much like your nibblings. They're all like, they literally all look like they're in the same. We, are, like, we look related. We yes. look related. Yes. yes. Um, so it's really been a process. And I have some um, books, like I always want to tell people books that you can read if you want to get into Octavia when your kids are older. There's some really mm -hmm. fundamentally wonderful books that people can read. Like the, the um, these books by T. Twee Sutherland, and she writes these dragon books where there are hardly any humans, but it teaches you, there's like a Black Lives Matter themed book. Awesome. And you wouldn't even know, uh, you wouldn't know that that's what you're being educated for. It never says yes. that, but yeah. you get it. And yeah. I never would have read those books without kids that love dragons or butterflies or whatever. So, the, you know, I love that. 
follow, follow uh, your affect, that positive yeah. obsession. Their obsessions are, you know, worthy, not just yeah. what I liked. No, I mean, I think that's so important. Like, no matter what age you are at, the obsessions you hold are, are just as important to you. And if they're encouraged, you can really create a life or at least a super vibrant mind that can do many things. And the characters that Octavia writes, especially the young ones, there's so much going on in those brains. And I think when we get older, we look back and we're like, oh, you're just young, you're going through this. It's like, I was already incredibly complex to myself, unto my, you know, like I was already thinking a lot of complex things at that age. That's part of why Octavia appealed to me so much when I read hers, I was like, she understands the interiority of caring about the world. She understands the interiority of caring about the species. She understands like what it's like to live inside of fear and wonder at the same time. And she, longing you know, and love so and desire. Yes. Even when you don't have access to those things. Yes. And a lot of her ideas are rooted in her adolescence and her yes. young adulthood. Yeah. Even though we're not calling her books new adult fiction or the genres that we use now. So I really think she's doing a lot of work and she's definitely a cultural theorist. Um, yeah. And not giving credit for that often enough. Yeah, I mean, I do, I'm grateful for the work that you've been up to, that Walid has been up to, that Toshi's been up to. Like, I just feel that um, Tarsha, all these different people, I'm like, you know, we are really doing our best. Oh, sorry. Time for me to take my medicine. Um, we have been doing our best to really meet this moment and spread the Octavia seed. You know, like we're like dandelioning our yes. our our fave. Um, but I'm like, it's the right time for it. Like I, I really think that people need Octavia. And I've had people ask me, like, how young can you be and be reading Octavia? And I'm like, quite young actually, because this is the world we're in. She's not writing anything that doesn't exist right now and that kids aren't being actually exposed to in less empowering right. ways. Um, but I'm like, yeah, that we're in Octavia's times. We're, we're, and we're not at the worst of them yet. Like there's still space. We could recover. We could do other options. We could do other things here. So yeah, I love the warning of it all. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that enlightening uh, conversation. Okay, we've got Ronaldo on the way. All right, Ronaldo's gonna make our night. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. One of the things that I um, would like to ask, and I'll take this question that's in the chat first. Uh, was Octavia Butler thinking okay. about climate change? Was Octavia thinking about climate change when she was collecting her ideas as a teenager? And can you talk about her work in the environment? So I can take this one. So if you want to know what she was thinking, you should read Shelley Streeby's book, The Future of Climate Change, which um, sometimes I'm able to just pull um, books off the shelf. It has a green cover. And what um, Dr. Streeby did is she really, yeah. she went into the archive and looked at Octavia's very, very early research um, on climate change and the environment before it was a hot ticket item and before people were discussing it. So late 60s, early 70s, thinking about all of the changes and deregulation that were happening in the 1980s around um, oil conglomerates and pollution and endangered species and all kinds of global, uh, globally impacted ideas. The future of climate change um, um, by Shelley Streeby is really gonna give you lots of background information on that. There's also a short article in um, Women's Studies Journal um, issues that Moya and I co-edited where Dr. Streeby discusses some of these things. Um, so there's lots of information out there. She definitely was thinking about it um, and she also grew up partially on a chicken ranch in the desert with her grandmother. And so that's when she's really living fundamentally like kind of off the grid, like with a well for water or water trucked in, um, you know, kerosene lamps, raising your own food and things like that. So she's thinking about sustainability because she knows what yeah. it is in the same ways that many of our, you know, immigrant parents keep all the plastic bags and reuse all of the margarine tubs, right? So she yes. understands something fundamentally about um, not the trendiness of recycle, reduce, reuse, but use it because you don't know when you're going to get another one. And that's how she accumulated 40 years worth of stuff. And it's like over 10,000 individual 
items right. that are at the Huntington Library in her archive. So yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> um, if you were both to recommend one Octavia Butler book to someone who's never read her work, for which would you recommend and why that one? Hmm. You pulling it off the shelf? Yes, I'm gonna say that people should read um, people should read uh, Blood Child and other stories because yeah. it's uh, she has a couple of essays in it. One of them is about writing. One of them is about her like. Uh, it's an article that she had originally published in Essence magazine in, I believe, 1989. Um, and it's her original positive obsession and some short stories that will really help you to get a wide range of the kinds of stories that she writes and the kinds of books. And if you don't have a lot of time, you can read them in small increments. And mm -hmm. I encourage people to like listen to audio books um, or do whatever it is that you do that helps you to interface the best. But I would say, yes, the short stories um, are going to be the place to start. That's what I would recommend. Yeah, I, um, I'm always really torn when I get this question because I'm like, if it's uh, for the sake of like strategy in these times, you need to read the parable of the sower. And I think everybody who's alive on this planet right now should be reading the parable of the sower. Um, I think we need to be prepared for um, the the radical right fascist governmental push that is not done yet, right? We're in a pendulum that swings back and forth with this one. And how do we form destiny, form community, and form survival strategies through the combined pandemic and crisis of climate change, the impacts of medication, the impacts of economic crisis, like all of that is in the parable of the sower. So for that purpose, I'm like, you have to read that. But if you're just like, what's the best best, best thing that, you know, Octavia ever wrote, I think you go to Wild Seed. And I think you read about Anyanwu because I think that that character is to me the the, the sort of the fully realized um, black woman whose roots go all the way back um, and go all the way forward. That's the, that's the person I'm trying to like embody and practice living into is my Anyanwu self, so yeah. And you'll be up to date Sorry, Dr. Anderson, you'll be up to date <laughs> before um, the Wild Seed show comes out that is in the works. Uh, I think it's it's on one of the streaming platforms, but it's being written by Nadia Korfor and Wenuri. Uh, um, so it's being it's being made by two. It's being created. And yes, Wild Seed followed up by Mind of My Mind. Those are yes. my two favorite. Books of hers. Oh, that, delicious. That, yes. No, no way around it. Yeah, but I mean, I think you should. I don't think there's a bad book. So right. Yeah. Any, all. How do you think that um, her ideas translate into other cultures? Because I know um, I found out recently, like I was contacted recently about some of my own work being translated into Portuguese. And they awesome. didn't have certain words for some of the concepts that I was dealing with. <laughs> uh -huh. and, I, and I also know how some of the things that we talk about here in the States are translated differently in other cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, also, depending on gender and orientation in terms of how they're translated. Do you think there are, have you seen other cultures where other aspects of her work seem to be received better than others? Mm. I mean, I will say that I just on a on a like what Octavia was up to, I feel like she always talked about the fact that she was writing these black stories, black characters, but she was writing in a way that was universal or where the lessons, the brilliance of what she was writing, the the directions that she was offering are universal directions that anyone could actually follow for the sake of their survival and for the sake of community. And no matter where you're from, reading in a way that helps you understand the leadership capacity of Black people is important for you, no matter what cultural space. Um, and also there's Black people in many, many cultures. So I think, I think yes. And I have traveled to, I've never, I don't think I've traveled anywhere where I don't mention Octavia's work. Um, like mm -hmm. I brought Octavia up in Dubai, I brought Octavia up in South Africa, I brought Octavia up all over Europe, I brought Octavia up anywhere I go. And people really, once they tap into the work, they really vibe with the, 
the complexity, the getting in right relationship with change. And I find in a lot of places, some of the things that feel very exciting sexually that she writes feel more commonplace in those spaces. So it, one of the things I found that tra travel helped me realize just how prudish Americans are <laughs> about a lot of the things. And um, where I'm like, ooh, you know, alien threesomes or whatever. They're like threesomes, whatever. Like, but, you know, so that part, I think, you know, in terms of translation, we're behind the curve of being able to talk about those things freely and enjoyably. Um, and then I think that the, the radical right presidential character and the radical right governmental system, I think now more people are experiencing like, oh, that's not just a U.S. specific thing, like that kind of fascist, you know, Judeo-Christian um, dominant system that's, that is actually a lot more universal than people necessarily acknowledge. So there was a period where I would travel to Europe and people were like, oh, that racism stuff, that's so, that's you guys. And I'm like, mm -hmm. this has roots where you are. It's happening right here, right now. <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. I do feel like it's a matter of time more than a matter of like cultural relevance in terms of how people engage with the ideas. That's what I think, I don't know, Ayana. Uh, I would say that there's been work in theorizing in other places, um, speak of Portuguese, Portuguese, like theater of the oppressed and so on and so forth, ways of working yeah. through trauma, right? That were existing before and revolutions in different places that we um, don't have access to because it's left out of our dominant education. So I feel like things probably hit different in some ways, yeah. um, but definitely uh, there is an identification and uh, a resonance with her work just because she's showing not just polar opposites, but people existing in the third, you know, people That's playing both, both sides. I mean, you were in Desert Storm, right? So no, you know- I was during the Cold War. They tried to get me for Desert Storm, but like I said, uh, Saddam did not use the N word on me. So I refused to report for duty. Uh -huh. so, mm -hmm. uh, but I would like to, uh, the uh, get a question from the inner space crowd here. Sometimes if we can get a question from inner space, if they have a question um, that they someone's been holding for a while. Okay, while I'm waiting for that question, mm -hmm. um, I, I, when I want to find out about a writer or whatever, I know their passion might be in fiction, but I would like to be interested in what type of nonfiction did Octavia Butler read? Mm hmm. Oh, everything, specialized like, encyclopedias, um, dictionaries. Like she would do an analysis of a word, like the word for um, xenophilia, right? Um, she would do an analysis of the word like as it was defined in 1939 and how it was defined in 1978, right? So she would say, here's the way that these definitions evolved. Um, biblical text, she was a, a, a biblical like scholar, all kinds of things astronomy, etiology of diseases, slime molds, so yes. many different nonfiction books and probably more nonfiction than fiction. Yeah. I think at some mm -hmm. point that she was reading, she's like, there's some things that people probably don't talk about, but they're like notebooks that she has where she went to borders when she could afford to buy her own books instead of just borrowing them from the library. And she would take the labels off of the back of the book and stick them all in one on one page. So you see the price tags from borders. I probably have some on the back of my books. Let me see. Oh, not this one, but you know, she has like the price tags and she's like, oh, I afforded this and I bought this. And that's, uh -huh. you know, specialized encyclopedias, all kinds of stuff. And she would listen to audiobooks and books on tape because she was a slow reader. Um, yeah. So I would also add the news. Like she was an avid, avid news reader and she wanted to read news from all different parts of the world. She really wanted to understand what was happening and she kept clippings of all kinds of stuff that was like, oh, this might be you know, this might be something I'll use in a story someday, but it was more like just my voracious mind needs mm. to have access to this information and this data. And reading that, that that was kind of how she approached her reading has helped me navigate. I'm like, the news is overwhelming. So I let my mind move towards what is intriguing to me and like why, trying to understand why is it intriguing to me and how can I gather these are pieces of the pattern of humanity in this time rather than just like, this is information that I can't do anything with or operationalize. Right. She would actually underline and make notes in the newspaper clippings 
argue with the points that were being made. And then she yeah. would go look up the scholarly journal in which this scientist or whomever made these statements and then continue to call them to task. Yes. Um, and it and it shows up in her writing. You don't ever see the seams of her work, but you but she's interfacing with the world in a way that is being presented to her and mm -hmm. knowing where she is and when she is. But she definitely had so much to say about also like C-SPAN politics. So not just popular news, but NPR, um, mm -hmm. she, like so, so many sources, a lot of the places that will tap Adrian and I or other people like, you know, NPR, Madeline Brand, like all these places. It's like such an honor because these were the ways that she kept up to date with people, even when she was living kind of as a hermit and being That's on right. her own, writing right. in isolation. One thing I think um, Octavia Butler was very patient about, and I can, and I was talking with a think tank out in the Bay Area about this. Um, we now know that I think France, for example, is one country that's looking at using augmented soldiers in terms of uh, putting them into combat. And so I guess the key word I'm looking at now is this idea of symbiosis, symbi mm -hmm. you know, in terms of um, there'll be two different types of people here in the new future, those people who are enhanced and those who are not enhanced. Yeah. And I think um, some of that um, seems to be the beginning of it, maybe around taking like the COVID vaccine, what people are saying, they're thinking, are they, gonna, are they trying to put a microchip in you? Does this impact your DNA? And one of the things I explained to our students based upon um, the book, The Coming Plagues, because of globalization, and the way plagues travel around the world, we are going to have to think about this for the remainder of this century, these things, mm -hmm. about the pandemics that travel globally about how we feel about vaccination. And yep. so it'll almost be, I can see this fragmentation of the society where I'm more in community with people who believe in science than the ones who don't believe in science. That's right. <laughs> and so I can see all these different kind of, 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 of fractures emerging in the society. Now, I don't know how um, it's going to play out across the spectrum of these countries or whatever, but I think the only part where I have a question about uh, maybe Octavia is the lessons that she's offering, I don't know if they can be consumed fast enough because change mm -hmm. is happening so fast. So that's why I'm like, could a religion like Earthseed survive the rapid acceleration of all of these reactionary forces in the world uh, yeah. emerging. I mean, one of the things I love about Earthseed, you know, Earthseed is the religion that is in the parable of the sowers and in the parable of the talents. And it's mm -hmm. what Lauren Olamina, the lead character, comes up with. And she, the idea is that God has changed, that change is the force that we have to reckon with. And Earthseed is all these verses that help us figure that out. And one of the things I, I really love about it is one of the rules for Earthseed is the community can only grow to be a thousand people. And once it reaches that size, it needs to break off into smaller communities and grow again and grow again. I keep thinking about that and uplifting that as I'm moving in community spaces of mediation, facilitation, just thinking about stuff. Cause I'm like, part of what causes a lot of our conflict and the um, the tension that we're in with each other is that we're actually trying to operate in spaces that are too large for us to actually be in relationship with each other. And once it's too large to be in relationship with each other, it's really hard to actually do symbiosis. It's hard to do mutual aid. It's hard mm -hmm. to be accountable to each other because it's all, it's, it's there's that estrangement that happens across time and space and distance. And I think it's one of the greatest lessons for me that makes me feel like I can confidently say I'm a post-nationalist. You know, I'm not tied to the American experiment. I'm tied to the human experiment. And just like the USSR came apart, like different formations, if they're too big and they're not aligned with humanity, they come apart. But the smaller experimentation of how humans move back into our tribal condition or move back into what is an indigenous or right relationship with the land that we're in those are probably gonna be smaller experiments. And I, I'm really curious about this, the way technology functions for those smaller communities. I think we already see it online. Social media is full of all these smaller networks of people who share values with each other and take care of each other. People got through COVID because they had these networks of people of various sizes that were smaller and that literally took care of each other, like literally redistributed resources and brought each other food and 
and took care, you know, like helped each other. I got a vaccine because someone in my network texted around and was like, here's what's available for these conditions. And like, here's where it is. And, you know, there's just so much that's already happening that way. But then we're still caught up in protecting ourselves from the experiment of, of American government. I'm really curious. And I think so much of her writing is like, that that experiment will eventually fail. So what do we do at that point? And I think to me, that's the prescient question we could be asking ourselves now is what are the ways we need to be practicing a society that carries us beyond empire, that carries us beyond um, this colonial project? One of the things like a project that I'm assigning to some students is like as a comparative literary exercise is having students read Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. Mm -hmm the parable, which mm -hmm. several years from now would be 200 years since de Tocqueville wrote that work. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and one of the things, we, and I always tell people, get the unabridged version, because uh -huh. de Tocqueville says in Democracy in America, he said, if there's going to be anything that would make the American experiment unravel, is how Americans had treated Black people. Yes. He said, and he observes this in 1831, 1830. And yeah. he's also witnesses the Trail of Tears also. And he saw how on the Trail of Tears that there were blacks who were enslaved to American Indians. And as mm -hmm. people now point out that uh, what they call the civilized nations in Oklahoma, they did not stop slavery until 1867. Mm -hmm. It was even after Lincoln there. So he said, this would be the one thing that might cause the United States to unravel. And uh, because the longer that black people stayed in the country, uh, accumulated a certain level of education and so on, it was going to bring out those contradictions mm -hmm. between what the country professed to be and then what it actually is. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I, I think that's going to be that's going to be an interesting exercise looking at this science fiction literature and then looking at this account from a European who was here studying us. Um, are there uh, I know we got a couple minutes left. Uh -huh. You said there are a couple of uh, shows that are in the works coming out. Outside of those, are there any movies uh, that you are aware of that people are working on to uh, bring any of this work to the mainstream public? That was like... <laughs> there, there are three things, right? So I mentioned Wild Seed. That's, um, uh, I think, Juvia, Juvia Productions, which is headed by um, Viola Davis. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also um, FX has ordered a pilot of Kindred, which is going to be like a limited series, um, like updated version of that book. Um, so the pilot of that has been ordered. And then, of course, in the works is Dawn, um, which was acquired by Ava DuVernay and yeah, Ray. Macro and yeah. Yeah. Right. So those are the three things that are in the works. And this is the closest we've ever come to having her work on screen. Although every single one of her works has been optioned at one point. Uh, yeah. At one point. I just heard a rumor, too, that there is a parables project in the works and that there's been like like. Significant steps towards it, like, the uh, you know, there's a director and all the things. But, um, you know, I, Bill, I, th I think the question came from Bill T. Jones, and I'm just like, I think this is interesting because there hasn't been a direct um, Octavia, you know, like one of her books directly made into a film. But I would argue that a ton of films that have come out <laughs> over the past 20 years have had Avatar. heavy influence, right? Avatar. Um, I can't remember the name of that one. Eli uh, Elijah, the Book of Elijah. The, there was this Book of Eli. The Book, the Book of, of Eli. Eli. That's right. Yeah, the Book of yes. Eli. I was just like, okay, y'all just didn't want to call it the parables. That's fine. But you know, <laughs> right. it's sort of like this is a story about a, a black person walking along the road in California yeah. with a, a massive destiny-based book that they're carrying. Whatever. So, yes, right. Uh, there's definitely been content that I think draws upon her ideas um, without necessarily naming it as such. And I, I think that's one of the things we want to counter in this next decade. This is why I'm so grateful that her work is on the New York Times bestseller list now, that we want to get more and more of her work on the New York Times bestseller list, that so many pieces of work and writing are coming out about her. Um, you know, Toshi Regan and I are doing the podcast 
reading the parables chapter by chapter together, Octavia's parables. And when we finish the parables, we're going to keep going and just read all of her work one after another, chapter by chapter, because all of it feels really relevant right now. And there's there the you can go and actually, I mean, like this is a magic time to be alive where you can actually go to Pasadena and get in a vehicle with Ayana and take a tour of Octavia's stomping grounds. Like we just are in this moment where it's like, oh, people are recognizing how important she was and she is to us. And whether it's film, whether it's television, whether it's other books, whether it's podcasts, whether it's live experiences, whether it's biographies, this is Octavia's era. Mm. Well, uh, any closing parting shots? I think we might have about a minute left. Mm. Um, this has been very enjoyable. I think they told me they're going to probably post this online for people oh. to see uh, in the near future, which I hope they, uh, people absorb everything that you all have shared with them. I think uh, uh, you all were great, both great speakers. Hope you, uh, you all participate in the rest of the festival. Um, tomorrow, as you all already know, we're going to see this interpretation of Drexia by uh, Andre Zachary and the Renegade Group and um, uh, here at New York Live Arts, uh, who I'm so uh, grateful that Bill T. Jones and work that Janet and the others have done to put this amazing event together. And um, I hope to hear from both of you very soon about the work you're doing. I know I'm I'm glad I hear about your book coming out, Adrian. I know Ayana's book coming out. I believe uh, Susanna Morris has a book coming out. So uh, yeah, we're doing this thing. You all will be putting a dent in my debit card uh, this okay. year. So, uh, so I would encourage everybody in the audience to uh, to support these uh, two speakers' work. Um, uh, as a parting shot, is there anything that you would encourage the audience to support as an act of service um, mm -hmm. related to the ideas of Octavia? And I'll stop right there and let Ayana and Adrian. Go, Adrian. Um, yeah, I would say support mutualaidindia.com. Um, there's a crisis happening in India right now where people do not have access to the vaccine and they are in, in the parable. They are dying in the streets. They are being buried in mass graves and, and being burnt in the streets. It's all happening right now. Um, and I would say to boycott, divest, and sanction Palestine. Uh, what's happening in, for what's happening in Palestine right now? So, Israel is in full-out assault. And again, these are the places where it's like the parable is already unfolding, and people are already being um, displaced, genocided, and all of that's unfolding. And we, it all happens with our tax dollars. It happens with sanctions and, and decisions we make. So, those would be, you know, pay attention to India, pay attention to Palestine, pay attention to Colombia. There's so much happening right now where. We can be good global citizens inside of um, inside of this political moment as we have the vaccine and we have so much more access than others have. Dr. Jameson, you have the floor. Sure. And if there's anything you want to see, if you want to follow, like Adrian's very active on social media, you can follow us on Twitter. We usually try to let folks know what we're doing, but sometimes things come out that we don't know about. Like, for example, there's a really lovely podcast, uh, the Throughline Project podcast that was put together. And if you want to hear Octavia's voice and you want to hear her prescience and more about her life and work, look for the free works that we already have contributed to, to with our public scholar, scholarship and our, you know, being the things that we offer for people, use them as teaching tools, use the work that Reynaldo and Black Speculative Arts Movement and the ideation, uh, Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute, the information is there and we're giving it to you. Um, and I feel like people should look at those things because the work is being done um, and we're very, very present with people to the to the extent that we can be because that's where you find out where to, you know, how to invest in mutual aid and how to be in community with people and be in community with us because I know that we, we love that. We love yeah. when people are in touch with us. So, And thanks so much for having Thank us. Thank you yeah, for like letting us be in conversation you. with each other. We love each other. So this we is love each other so much. She's definitely my soulmate and sister in Octavia. This is like a reunion for the ages, yes. making my whole year. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for participating in the Live Ideas Festival. <laughs>